Well, um, let me make a couple of brief announcements before I introduce Jane and the topic Elders for Infants. Um, first of all, I just want to let people know to uh, look for your um, messages from Safe Passage. There's a lot going on, one of which is that uh, we are connected with a group of people who are adult survivors of child maltreatment who are forming a support group, and um, we are sharing information about that group and how to connect with them. Uh, so um, keep your eyes out for an announcement that's just came out or is about to come out on that. Um, secondly, um, I always want to let people know about the next webinars coming up, and I'll mention that briefly at the end as well. But um, in two weeks, we have a presentation uh, by um, Kirsten Anderson, who is the executive director of Aspire. And if you're not familiar with it, Aspire is a, uh, an organization that's an association of people, of organizations in the uh, child welfare arena, and she's going to talk about the uh, Federal Families First Act, which is the, um, you know, the, made the, the most important piece of legislation, the biggest piece of legislation in federal child welfare arena uh, since the 1990s, I believe it was when CAPTA came around. It's really complicated and technical, uh, but she can explain it, and I think she's probably the leading expert on what's in it and how it works, and essentially the um, the, Cap, the um, Families First Act is moving a lot of child welfare money from the federal government towards the preventive end of uh, the child welfare uh, world so that um, we spend more time and money on focused on prevention. But it has many uh, technical issues in terms of what kinds of programs get approved and what impact it's having on other parts of the, uh, of the field. So uh, that's an important thing to know about, and she's the best source to know about as well. And um, lastly, let me just say that we are going to take a break from webinars in August because a lot of people are on vacation, but we have several really uh, interesting webinars um, already lined up beginning in September. So we'll just uh, watch for those as well. So with that, let me introduce Jane. Jane Kretzman uh, is a person that uh, we've known each other for many, many years. Uh, Jane is one of those uh, you know, people who has a, a lot of influence in uh, our world, particularly in the early childhood development part. Um, Jane was a um, senior fellow and director of the Project for Babies at the University of Minnesota <clears throat> at the Center for Early Education and Child Development, uh, otherwise known as SEED, for a number of years. For many years, she was a senior program officer, both for the Bush Foundation <clears throat> and for the St. Paul and Minnesota Community Foundations. And prior to that, Jane worked in refugee resettlement, which is where I first met her, uh, including a decade as Minnesota State Refugee Coordinator. So uh, very powerful resume. And she's gonna tell us about uh, Elders for Infants. I'm not gonna steal your thunder, but Elders for Infants is basically a group of senior people like Jane who um, are out there uh, doing good work and bringing people together around child development issues. So that's as much as I'm going to say, and um, I'll turn it over to you, Jane. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Um, and really good to be with all of you. Thank you, Stephanie, as well. I am um, happy to be here. I, um, I'm going to uh, just give you a quick tour of our elders group, and I think that it's fair to say that we came together um, in well, I had retired, um, a colleague of mine said, you really ought to meet this guy, Jim Nikolai, who'd just written a paper on uh, the need to invest in infants and toddlers. We met, and then from there, we, we grew our group, but only to um, seven, actually eight people, just seven now. So I will go to the next slide here, and I'll tell you a little bit about who's on it. Um, so Glennis Edwal was formerly the Director of Children's Mental Health and, and Adult Mental Health, and she's a psychologist and policy person. Um, Dave Ellis has now moved to New Jersey where he's the Director of the Office of Resilience. Um, he and I got to work together quite a bit on ACEs and neuroscience in, um, when I was at, with the Project for Babies. Sandy Heideman, was, uh, her career was in early childhood special ed. She worked at Southside did a lot of work with families. And um, then Jim has been a childcare advocate, worked at GMBCA, and uh, has been an advocate for a uh, provider and advocate. Glenn Palm was the director of child and family studies at St. Cloud State University. He's uh, conducted 
uh, education for parents in the St. Cloud prison for 25 years. He's been really active with the fatherhood project in Minnesota. And um, Mary Kay Stronick is a public health nurse. She was the director of MELD, Minnesota Early Learning Design, so she's had some, which is a peer parent educator, um, parent educator work, but she also is a, a licensed parent educator. And then Katie Williams was the director of childcare at the YWCA in Minneapolis. So we began a uh, meeting in 2014, uh, kind of by chance, um, Jim Nikolai was wandering around the state capitol and happened to bump into, uh, well, I shouldn't say bump into, he wandered into Representative Dave Pinto's office. And he said, oh, excuse me, I'm in the wrong place. And Dave said, no, you should really tell me what you're working on. And thus began a kind of interesting journey where, um, Representative Pinto has really um, come to embrace the, the subject of prenatal to three and as an issue. And also we began then sponsoring um, the prenatal to three forum. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay. So that'll tell you a little bit more about what our um, domains are. So we've, we've had, um, I, just to say these with the, our domains is I've kind of covered this already, but but basically, from from our childcare people, we worry about how infants and toddlers fit within the quality rating system and parent aware. Uh, what kind of uh, they have not been a priority for the scholarships uh, for the early learning scholarships. We've struggled with uh, getting screening accomplished before the age of three because we know so much more from the brain science. We've we miss fathers so often in discussions around parenting and, and uh, care, caring for infants and toddlers. We've struggled because parents in general in Minnesota have not had a tremendous amount of support. Just as an FYI, um, the Early Childhood Family Ed, which is nearly a half century old, started uh, uniquely in Minnesota, has, did not, after 2003, have a statewide director for a decade. And now it is, uh, has a part-time one, and we've been trying to help get greater attention and leadership to that, the whole opportunity of what early childhood family ed could be in terms of supporting parents. Then um, with infant early childhood mental health, um, mental health consultation, of course, has been a major theme of the state getting to childcare programs and also uh, growing to help support home visiting. And within mental health, we've had, and I'll talk more about this in a little bit, within child protection, prevention and healing, I, um, the Project for Babies did quite a bit to bring um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study to Minnesota. And also with that came the, the need for a focus on healing and resilience. Then I would say for Glenn's work, especially, and as we've begun and worked on the idea of what are, what are the pipelines for preparing future childcare providers, future parent educators, a lot of the programs have, have closed and they've closed in part because of low compensation for people who become childcare providers or parent educators. And um, so we're losing, we're losing some capacity to prepare the workforce of the future. And then uh, lastly, of course, we've been very concerned about how much um, brain development happens at the beginning of life and how little we spend on that particular um, amount of, we, how little we spend on that time of life. So um, that's a piece. And then of course the compensation for, for the professional workforce. So our, you know, on some level, these are just so many domains, but they're so integral to development, which is so integral. So we'll go to the next slide. So our approach has been to create space for people. We are clearly, we are retired. We are on the outside. Um, think of, I'm sorry, that X maple, that should be really example, but anyway, there you go. Um, we are not um, we are not players in the way that we once were, 
but we also feel like as village elders, it's really important to lift up what's happening with uh, this prenatal to three population and their families. And then last year we did a special series on black dads um, and the unique challenges they, they face. I think our, our approach of working upstream is that our, it really is grounded in the, again, in the science that says if we make these investments early, we're going to um, save money in the long run. And in a time of extremely limited resources, or at least the per perception that we have extremely limited, that babies are just not good advocates for themselves. And as anyone knows who's parented a baby or a toddler or tried to raise a little, a couple of little ones, their parents have, who could advocate have no time. So it's very hard to build a constituency for babies. And that's been a, a, a continues to be an ongoing issue. Um, so we'll get, to, we'll get to that in our discussion. And then there's an article by Liz Davis and Aaron Sojourner about investments in the population of zero to three and particularly with early care. And we, according to them, we spend about $200 per child compared to 5,000 up to, up to age two, compared to a five-year-old of of at least 5,000 a year in public dollars for public school. So we're, we've got some big gaps and we, we wanna help um, those who are making decisions about the strategic places for investments and policy change. So it's, it's really in that, how can we be the nudge, I guess you would call us um, and, and also provide the space. So next slide. So just a quick thing here that it's always a baby and there is no such thing as a baby. A baby can't survive without another adult in a relationship. You've heard a lot about toxic stress and you've heard probably about positive stress, which is, you know, the visit to, to the doctor, um, the tolerable stress can be almost toxic, which is uh, something life changing but if there's a relationship, an adult relationship to, to help buffer, that then is tolerable stress and toxic is the unremitting, un, unbuffered stress. So our question then becomes, how do we support the adults who support the baby? And the thing I wanna talk some about with you today, which is, will tie into the presentation and discussion you have next week, or at your next meeting rather, is um, an approach that offers promise for both foster parents and biological parents of infants and toddlers in the child protection system. And it's called ABC. So we'll go to the next slide. And many of you have already heard of this. It's called attachment biobehavioral catch-up. And ABC was developed by Mary Dozier at the University of Delaware more than 20 years ago. And they're kind of four things you probably should know about it. One, it, ABC is an evidence-based intervention. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the evidence. I am think of me as um, someone who will give you the high points, but there are a lot of people who can give you the depth of um, work on this because there, there is, it is rooted. There are some roots in Minnesota that I think are important we can talk about. So ABC is evidence-based. Secondly, it was developed specifically for and work within the child protection system. And Minnesota it offers ABC throughout the state. It's one of just a few states nationally. So it's present and there are people trained in it, but it is not widely used. And they have also uh, been able to demonstrate that it can be imp implemented using telehealth. So we'll move on to the next. So attachment biobehavioral catch-up. You can read the slide with me, but basically infants and toddlers who have had this toxic stress, unremitting uh, adversity, face challenges forming trusting attachments with parents and in developing adequate regulatory strategies. 
They need nurturance. They need parents who behave in ways that are synchronous, you know, that are in a, attuned to them and parents who delight in them. And they need parents who are not frightening to them and who can provide clear signals. And so that's really at the heart of how to, how to make that parenting relationship work in a way that promotes attachments. So we can move on. So we said earlier, it's evidence-based and aiming at infants and toddlers with adversity. It's been endorsed nationally. So the MICV is the, is the national home visiting um, funding program. California's evidence-based clearing for child welfare has approved it and SAMHSA has. And the ABC is available for infants and toddlers between six and 24 months of age and then for toddlers between 24 and 48 months. And you can see there, there are a couple of different programs uh, within or styles or strategies within ABC. Okay, we'll go on. And then I just wanna call out that this is a 10 week program. It's 10 in the moment coaching sessions. I have, um, I will add that I've met with Mary Dozier or not, I've met her, I've listened to her present and I'm aware that this work is done, can be done with not just family and it, it can also include extended family. And it's been done with both foster parents and with biological. So to just give you a little uh, sense of how these 10 sessions work, the first three are really providing nurturance as the ABC coach to the relationship. Three and four teach the parent how to follow the child's lead and delight in the child. Sessions five and six point out how the parent can frighten the child. They don't do that early in the sessions one to three in order to not create defensiveness in the parent, but to really help um, engage and then begin to teach them about reading the child's signals and not being so so scary. And then voice in section, section seven and eight, talking about voices from the past and providing nurturance and delighting in difficult contexts. So really helping address some of those ghosts that are can really haunt parents. And then nine and 10 consolidating gains. And then they continue to build on strengths to develop a secure attachment. So over the course of the 20 years, and we'll go to the next slide here, they've been able to show outcomes that are quite profound and lasting. So children who have, a, who have the ABC um, intervention are more likely to be securely attached to their caregivers. That can be both their foster parents or their bio parents if, they're, if that becomes part of the process. Children develop more normative stress hormone patterns. And in, I just wanna note that one of the studies that I saw was about cortisol levels and that they were able to bring down cortisol levels and improve sleep patterns. And that these cortisol levels stayed down for several years and even into middle childhood, despite the fact there might still be chaos in the home, the kids and the parents were able to have that kind of relationship where cortisol wasn't up. Children could then develop better impulse control. They show less anger during a challenging task. They've been able to uh, switch between complex tasks uh, more easily. That's that executive functioning and have um, measurably better receptive language and they respond, parents respond to their young children with more sensitivity. Again, um, I've got some articles which I will pass along to um, Rich and Stephanie that I can, that will give you even more background. But again, just wanting to kind of put this out here. So we'll go to the next one. And here's what, where we are. And this is, this is the challenge uh, slide for ABC. So despite many years of research, um, the federal approval of ABC as a re reimbursable intervention under Families First Prevention Services Act is still in process. I think it's, um, 
I, I just, I don't know enough. I don't know. I, all I know is it, it isn't in the first round and hasn't been approved yet, but it is in, in process. Secondly, we have a low number of referrals for infants and toddlers in Minnesota to ABC. And that's, um, they could be referred from child protection. They could be, be referred by home visitors. Most referrals are for ages three years old and older. And, um, and there, I would just add in this last point, there's similar resistance in other programs like childcare to prioritize infants and toddlers. And I, I think again, it's, um, it's a complicated situation. Sometimes we've seen it in my work with, um, at Bush even, um, that people tend to think, well, let the baby and the mother be alone or, or they um, react even, well, anyway, things, things are challenging for getting referrals for infants and toddlers, it's complicated. So, and that's, if you wanna learn more, this is one of those um, places. And I do have a little two and a half minute video if we can tee it up, um, but this is the website for attachment biobehavioral catch-up intervention. And we'll, well see. Jane, we I just wanna yeah. say, I don't, it's not responding. I don't it's not responding. Know. Okay, well, okay. let's. I don't know. Uh, Stephanie was going to try to queue it up. Any luck with that, Stephanie? Uh, can can I share? Make you a. Um, um, this is a this is a website address. It does not have a video located on it. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Right. It might well, be a different link. We might need a different link. We might need a different link, and I well, if yeah. I uh, we'll see. I think we've got enough to talk about, but basically, this is sort of the um, the thing. And, um, Jane, I can always um, I can always send out the link to the video after the webinar Afterwards. too. Let's, we have let's email addresses for yeah, everyone. Let's so. Okay, let's do that. Yes, and, and um, you mentioned articles that you uh, can share as well. So we can send those out to all of you who are participating, and we will also put it on our website along with uh, a uh, you know a video of of today's presentation. So you'll be able to access it yeah. either way. That sounds so. great. Yeah, so, um, so what I would say is that the, um, you know, I don't know where you'd like to start. Um, I think our, I think though, you know, it's been an interesting run at this point. I don't see that we are I don't, I'm, I'm not finding an institutional home for infants and toddlers these days in terms of where will, where will such advocacy or where will such, but it's kind of, we've got great people at the University of Minnesota working in different arenas, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's much easier to deal with preschool than it is with babies and prenatal and uh, so things are coming, but it's it's. Uh, but I'm really interested in your questions, and I thank you for your time. Well, let me uh, see if you have questions. Please just unmute yourself and jump in, and um, we'll take it from there. I just want to say, you know, for starters, Jane, that, um, you know, I think you're talking about not uh, having an institutional home for yourself or not being players anymore, but I think of you as sort of like the British system where you have a minister without a portfolio. You know, oh. you have a senior, a senior individual who reports to the prime minister uh, and, and can just kind of go where they Well, that's a good, interesting... Um... Interesting perspective, yes. We try to be useful. And um, I think that sometimes the challenge is that, that, you know, that, that, you know, the last 20 years have yielded such a scientific revolution in terms of 
how early experience affects later cardiovascular health, uh, diabetes, all kinds of things. There's just so much more we know. And, and then we also know with neuroscience how much is, happens in the brain. So all these, this kind of convergence of the new science has made it very hard for systems to catch up. And, and that's, um, you know, we kind of can beat the drum, but at the same time, we're, we're all running fast to kind of build the capacity in order to apply what we know in a new way. If I, you know, if I could take an example of adolescence being another time when the brain reorganizes, we, we see now that um, Daniel Siegel and some of the other uh, parenting gurus that are out there, that young people really have a chance to reopen what happened to them and be able to move forward with a sort of a new um, arrangement in their brains that will, will allow them to be more functional, if you will, if they've, if they've had a dysfunctional beginning. So it's, it's really important that we talk about a zero to three and we talk about this role of early in experience initiating um, as, as an initiating condition, if you will, for development, but it really is um, not over. It's just gets, it does get more difficult. It's just that it, there are opportunities and they do really open up in adolescence again, so. So Jane, if somebody wanted to make a referral and get uh, the, the uh, ABC you know, program, who yeah. would they refer to? Well, what I would recommend is that people, people start with, uh, if, if you wanna go to the source, um, Catherine Wright at the Department of Human Services has an early childhood mental health system, infant early childhood mental health system. And they have grants. I, I, um, I can send you this slide, but there's a, the, the, um, what we call IECMH, the in, Infant Early Childhood Mental Health System, has providers trained in evidence-based interventions in all 87 counties. And that is true for um, ABC and also with two tribes. So I will send you that, but there are, um, there's a map that I've got, which I can send you, but I would contact Catherine Wright. And actually, as I say, for going deeper in this, Catherine is the administrative holder of this system. And the people who have been trained in ABC that she knows who are here and who are available. So we have a question. Could this 10 week program be done in a class or group setting? Because you said it can be done via telehealth, but uh, what is the actual setting? You know, usually the setting is in the home. And um, I think that the, the group, uh, to, to just tell you one, one uh, so, so it can be done in a group in the home, but usually it's with that family, family system. Um, ideally, at some stage, a child who might be an out-of-home placement might have, or especially an infant-toddler situation here, where both the foster parent and the bio parent would have the experience of ABC. So the child would have a similar sort of frame of reference about what what both are trying to do. But they wouldn't. I, what I don't know is would they that be done jointly or separately? But there are states that are doing that of doing a kind of parallel process. Now, the group setting that you ask about that might be relevant is called circle of security. And that's, um, that's an earlier intervention with parents and where they might need more, they would be referred to ABC. Circle of security is privately run and many of you know this, so. Uh, and then you all can uh, use the I chat function or just unmute yourself and jump in. But we have a, another question. Does this program screen parents for poor literacy skills? Yeah, I don't know, Mark, um, about that. I, I would say that would be, I, you could check on the, once you get to their website, you could look and, and would also think, um, I'm, 
I, I know from presentations, I've heard about it, that you do not have to have high literacy skills to participate in this program. And, and Mark, if you're listening, I know you were on the prenatal to three forum this morning, and I don't know if you noticed that um, Dave Pinto, Representative Dave Pinto mentioned that there is uh, a, a family, um, a target home visiting program that does uh, focus on literacy. So uh, you might want to follow up with Dave Pinto on that because I know that's an interest of yours. Yeah. Um, again, please feel free to unmute yourself or, and or use the chat box. Well, what can I chip in? Please do. Uh, what I found out a few years ago is that 70% uh, of uh, people in prisons, nationally average, have very poor literacy skills. And we don't really screen for that. We don't even think about it. And that, uh, uh, that this is a multi-generational problem. In other words, if I were still in practice, I would be literally trying to figure out which of my mo new mothers have very poor literacy skills. In other words, finding, I think that is a very high risk factor. Yeah. And these mothers also don't know to do reading with them. I've talked to local police and they, one guy who was very <clears throat> observant noticed that there aren't children's books in these homes of high risk families that he would visit as a police officer. Oh, so I, I think we're missing something that we don't think about and that is uh, poor literacy. The police very much know the illiteracy problem among prisoners, but the rest of us do not. And I think that's uh, our ignorance is apparent here and we don't have a good strategy. And the first three years I think is probably very key to changing all of that for the mothers and for their babies. I don't just, yeah, I wouldn't disagree at all. I think that um, the, two things maybe to think about. One is, because I know this has been a concern of yours for a long time, is, um, you know, I think about Reach Out and Read because it does provide a book, at least. Um, but also, whether there are um, kind of finding people of common cause uh, that would, would be interested in working on that issue specifically, um, I think is a, is a timely one. The mother's ed education is key, one of the keys to um, how kids, how kids do. And uh, some of my friends have said that if it weren't for uh, the religious education that they got, which taught them to read the Bible, they never would have learned to read. Um, because the schools were so poor where they grew up. And uh, so I think there are different places to be working and it, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. I don't, so keep beating the drum, but also maybe there's some more people to engage in, uh, in that particular slice of this because I think it's a unique one in a way, but definitely connected. So Jane, I think I'm, I'm just not picking up on something, but if I'm in, you know, Fergus Falls or Albert Lee or Dakota County or, you know, in the Twin City, do I just, would I just call a mental health clinic or the county mental health agency to, to find out where I can get this, I this think uh, service? I would call, I think what I would do when, like I say, I am trying to read my, like, the different agencies, like Wilder is one of these that has an early childhood mental health grant. So what I would say as an example is, I think what I would do is go to the Department of Human Services to their children's mental health uh, division. Excuse me for just a minute here. Um, children's mental health division. And then um, either, con you could contact Catherine Wright to get that to get that map, if you will, but I think children's mental health in these different counties, it's the the counties vary in their size, but every one of them has access to a, an early childhood mental health system. So, family and children's like there's the I'm looking here. Counseling Services of Southern Minnesota is one of the grantees. But that's what you would be looking for. I, I would assume that the county 
would have knowledge of it. So the state, the county child protection unit should know. But I think to ask Catherine Wright would be another. You get better. Again, where is Catherine Wright to be found? Catherine Wright is she is at the Department of Human Services. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like there is not an agency in the state that is responsible for, you know, increasing the uptake of this particular approach. Um, you know, like in early childhood, there's an agency within the Department of Education. You know, there's no no owner for it. Well, I think it's the issue is that um, at this point, one is I'd say the Children's Mental Health Division in DHS is responsible for that system. I think that the people working on the Families First Prevention Act, which would be in permanency, child permanency and planning, um, they would be, they are looking or watching for when ABC would become a reimbursable service. So there's been sort of a parallel process of people building a system and then working to get it, have it more fully funded. So it becomes an eligible service. Right, and just that kind of is a, uh, you know, relates to our next webinar, which is that the process for using federal money, which has been mostly tied up in foster care and moving it to prevention, yeah. uh, includes having to kind of certify various programs and services and say that they're eligible for federal funding. Well, it's taken, uh, you know, an unearthly amount of time for the federal government to do that. Uh, in the meantime, they've kind of unhooked the, the revenue hose from residential treatment center and group centers and some foster care. And, you know, and, but they haven't yet hooked it up to the prevention services. Like Anything the else? Oh, my goodness. So you've just got a dry spell there, speaking of. Yeah, there is some, but it's just been very slow to get through very. that pipeline. So, again, um, that's something that Kirsten Anderson will talk about in a couple of weeks, but it's a huge funding uh, issue. It's a crisis. Uh, somebody hit the pause button on one end of the system, but they didn't, you know, unpause it on the other. So um, that's just, you know, by way of explanation of what the next webinar is going to cover. Well, that's, um, I think, so timely. Yeah. And it's, you know, if going back several decades, I think of um, when they closed the, um, the mental health, the mental, the, the asylums, the state hospitals, and put the, we're supposedly putting money into community mental right. health, which lasted for a while, but even there, we've lost a lot of resources mm -hmm. um, at that local community level. So yeah, it's a big, you're talking about a, a huge systemic problem there. Yeah. Yeah. Ponderous is the word that comes to mind. Um, Ponderous. Yeah. Other questions, uh, just please unmute and jump in. I, I have a question. Um, this is Judy Schumacher. Hi, Judy. Hi, Jane. Um, I, I was uh, attending the prenatal to three forum this morning. Um, it's very encouraging, the kinds of dollars that are going into uh, prenatal to three. Um, I always, my focus is always on prevention. Yeah. Uh, I, I know we can't ignore the rest. God knows there, <laughs> there are huge challenges everywhere um, but the because there is so much current um, scientific uh, mm -hmm. work going into um, brain development um, we know so much more about how babies brains work how they are developed how behavior and nurturing um, um, can go into whether or not those babies are healthy um, but I, I always wonder about, we can know so much about it, but I think a lot of this goes back to parenting. And mm -hmm. um, I don't see enough uh, focus on parenting. Um, we can, you know, I must have been here. Let me try to switch my camera here. Um, there we go. Um, I, I just think that, if we get the word out to people before they become parents, we have a much better shot at them being yeah. intentional parents. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think we should start talking about relationships and parenting when kids are in junior high or even before. Oh, yeah. 
Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I, we don't do enough of that. There isn't enough focus on parenting. And we know how crucial I, parents are in all of this, obviously. Yeah. Well, I, and I think that you would find, certainly among our elders, this frustration that, especially for zero to three, we're not doing enough. And that's what led us into the ECFE conversation. And it's the lack of support from the state for years. And now uh, the chance to actually reboot ECFE in a way that brings it more uh, relevant, makes it more relevant. It's in 300 school districts. Uh, many people formed connections that lasted forever, but were we're really, and, and I think in some ways we're paying such a price now, we don't even realize it. That's one of our challenges. Can um, you just right, say what ECFE but, is but, for people who may not um, have run into that? Early either. Childhood Family Ed. Early Childhood Family Ed. It's a unique Minnesota, it's administered through community education, not through K-12. And it is, uh, but it is in the Department of Education. And it's a it has home visiting, it works prenatally, its priority is the youngest years, but it spans through great uh, middle school, I think, maybe even into adolescence. So Minnesota has been really unusual for that. But I, and I also think um, a group like Family Wise, which used to be Minnesota Communities Caring for Children, which is a prevent child abuse Minnesota group, they're doing a lot with parents to try to help them become, heal from their own trauma to become better parents. So it's a but I agree. I think Minnesota tends to judge, judge the parents. I mean, that's been a recurrent theme, even in early care and education. Why did they even have these kids if they couldn't afford to educate them? Um, that's a big deal. Um, our future workforce sort of depends on people having kids. So, and not and knowing what they're doing when they when they have kids. And knowing what they're doing when they have them. That's right. And and as Aaron Sojourner has written. We expect the most from families when they have the least. These are young parents. They have little money. They're tossed in many times to just trying to figure it out for themselves because we don't have a very good support system for parents. And, um, and, and, and. So it's, yeah. I, I, I wish there could be, a, yeah, a na some national public push about parenting and the quality and how to do this. and. I just think that would that would do so much in terms of preventing the traumas that we see all the I time. I agree. Well, Judy, you know, I know how to find you. I, I think we'll Good. Have find to me get together on that. Yeah, we want to brag a little. Judy is one of our board members. And yeah. um, since we're on topic, I want to make sure everybody knows about the prenatal to three forum, which uh, Jane moderated this morning. Jane was saying that they had 270 people sign up. I don't know how many showed up and even if you have a 50 percent melt rate that's you know 130 some people um but it's a quarterly forum so if you have any interest in or connection to uh prenatal to three issues or early childhood brain development this is the place to be it'll get you up to speed on everything that's going on in the state in the short time and the next one's going to be in person when you can actually go and and meet people so if you're not familiar with it um you know you can send us a message and i'll, I'll get you a link to it uh, or you can just put, uh, I think it's uh, p2.3.org, isn't it? And is it T-O or the number two? Um, I think it's P-T-O. Yeah, it's P-T-O. And yeah. get yourself on the list. Um, Thank you. That'd be great. And as I say, uh, Jane moderated that this morning, so you've had a full day of webinars. Um, yeah. Jane, thank you for doing all this work. You've done it for so long, and it's such a critical piece of healthy kids and families. Well, it's been, a, it's been a great journey, an interesting one. And I thank the Bush Foundation because they started work on child development with Irving B. Harris on their board. And he was a St. Paulite who uh, believed in child development as an anti-poverty program. Mm -hmm. And before me, before my time there, they started a national program in uh, child development and social policy. Um, postgraduate work that really has, you know, put some very key people out there. The founder of Head Start, the guy that uh, was at the helm in North Carolina when Part C was started in 1975, were all involved in the Bush work. So my job at Bush was 
uh, to find a way to reduce risk to poor outcomes for kids in the three state region of the Dakotas and Minnesota. And we happened on uh, creating statewide training programs uh, for caregivers of infants and toddlers. And in the Dakotas, they both state agencies did, did, and there were tribes who picked up that program. In Minnesota, we trained uh, over 150 people in the Program for Infant Toddler Care, which is an attachment-based um, education program on infants and toddlers in groups. And, uh, but that did, did not stick. Um, it did not stay in terms of the state um, investment. But Bush invested like 15 years. So we have a lot of people that were very involved in that. But that led me to work on infant mental health, uh, home visiting, uh, kind of a host of things that led when the Bush Foundation decided to stop their work in child development. That's when they made the grant for me to move to the St. Paul Foundation to start the project for babies. And so that- You know, I think it needs to be said, I don't know how, you know, what fields everybody here is in, but they have made huge progress. I mean, at this point, there are $70 million a year investment in early learning scholarships. And mm -hmm. uh, not long ago, the State Department of Education made infants and toddlers the priority population and children at high risk. Yeah. Uh, we just put $500 million in additional money into child care, uh, you know, with a focus on um, kids who are at the lowest income levels. Uh, so a huge amount of work has been done because of people like you, Jane, and the, the, all of the people, Art Rolnick, all the folks who have been working yeah. on this, Minnesota Business Partnership for the last uh, 10, 15 years. And so, you know, uh, it, it, it really has been a major change in the resources available. So I think we tend to focus on the gaps and the things that haven't been covered. But uh, let's look down the mountain a little bit and see how. Far it's important. To, it's important to look up a little bit and and or as you say, look down and but but not forget what's that there. We have made some some headway. You know? A lot of headway. Now, is elders to infants uh, a five hundred one c three? Are you no? Are you, are Actually, you legal, Jane? No, we are we are the Margaret Mead type people of you right. know seven people or whatever, and so we we in some ways it's been a challenge because. We have other people who would like to join and we, you know, just getting seven people together is its own challenge. Um, we, we haven't wanted to compete for funds. We haven't wanted to become another nonprofit. Um, and yet I think there's a, there's sort of a, a, enough of the gray panther in me that says if that really old people are sort of, should be worried about the future just as much as anybody and that we've got it take action as much as we can. So we couldn't, haven't been able to uh, find a home at ARP yet. You know, I mean, we've kind of talked about, talked with them a little bit. Um, but I think uh, as time evolves, there may be something that will get born out of this that would be intergenerational. Because I think that's the other kind of great joy of this is working across um, the generations. So, but we are just us. Yeah. And the forums are put on by the University of St. Thomas. They donate all of that. And then, of course, Representative Pinto and Damoth are both donating time. So, yeah. So, uh, other questions or things you want to know more about? Just unmute and jump in. Well, as I say, I, I hope you, um, if I've made, if, if anything to just make you curious about ABC and keep antenna out because I think it's got a lot to, a lot of potential. And we've well, got- Maybe that's something we can work on at the legislature together, Jane. In absolutely. The coming years. Um, well, let me just say in closing that, that I think that we have two areas of intersection, Jane, with elders for infants. One is that uh, we're both very interested in prenatal to three early childhood because of the tremendous importance of children, uh, you know, having the circumstances to have good brain development during that period of time. And secondly, you were saying babies aren't good advocates for themselves. Uh, and um, that's really the space to, that uh, Safe Passage for Children is in, is to advocate for children who otherwise, I mean, they're, they're, um, can't advocate for themselves and their parents are 
caught up in the child welfare system and are in actually kind of a conflict relationship with the county. So uh, their their interests are really not in the mix unless uh, someone speaks up for them. And that's our role as well. Um, so again, I just want to say for two weeks from now, um, the Federal Families First Act is probably the most important uh, federal piece of legislation and funding in 30 years. And it's really complicated to understand. So if you want to kind of get it in one place, you really, if you're anywhere near child welfare, you kind of need to know what's going on with Families First. And this is a nice way to get a frame to work with so it's not just totally a mystery. So I hope you can show up in two weeks. Um, if there's any other questions, we would have time for one more. Uh, otherwise, feel you know, feel free. Okay, well, otherwise, Jane, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I've been wanting to know more about Elders for Infants myself for a long time, which is why I called you and invited you. And thanks to thank all you. of you for Thank you all for your time today, too, and for your work. So, yeah. We okay. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. See you Take soon. Care. Yeah. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.